Animation has been a medium that I have consumed and created my entire life. One of my earliest memories was being four years old, waking up super early before uh, the sun rose to watch Jetix and then sneaking back up to bed when regular programming started. A defining hobby of my early teens was using my mother's 3DS to uh, l make stop motion animation with my Lego. The first TV show to ever make me cry was Bluey. Bluey. Before that, I'd only shed a tear for like, um, once for Logan and the other one was for A Quiet Place. Ah! That's a five year gap between, um, like the last thing to make me cry and, and Bluey. Bluey! What the f- And I hope we're friends forever and ever and ever. I'm bored, bro. Don't call me Anthony Fantana. It's frustrating to think that animation still gets a bad rap from some people that like associate it with uh, media targeting children, um, you know, which has historically not been of the best quality sometimes. Like, I kind of get that opinion, but like it dismisses like all of the good shows. Like um, right now, Abney and Teal, and Hey Dougie are extremely sincere, but they don't like take themselves too seriously. They're the mature, patient works with expressive and unique art styles with stories that suitably balance like goofs with education. Bad stuff and good stuff have always like been out there. And so it's redundant to just associate kids shows with, with poor quality and no philosophy. Like how long has Sesame Street been around? <laughs> four decades we've been making a mature animated art that can be appreciated on emotional and intellectual levels but I think only recently we've kind of reached a breaking apex point with the recent Spider-Verse trilogy. After that moment with Bluey at the start of the year I took it upon myself to be more conscious about animation no matter the target demographic and I've come across a lot of really great works and creators. The point of this video is to highlight my favourite shorts that I've seen in the past year, mainly because the three that have like really resonated with me all kind of mostly fit under the same kind of category, um, like an animated work that's under 10 minutes in length. But first, stuff that I enjoyed that didn't release in 2023. Smiling Friends, Clone High, the 2003 Clone Wars series, Hisui and Snow, uh, the Parappa the Rapper anime, Bluey of course, um, Flea, The New Puss in Boots, Moral, Oral, Lilo and Stitch, don't ask how I've not seen that before. A Bunch of Ghibli, Henry Selleck's entire filmography, Cowboy Bebop for the second time because people were saying the dub was as good as the sub, it's comparable, and various exercises by Vince Collins and Takashi Ito. I also started Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir and watched the new movie. It's okay. Stuff that I enjoyed that did release in 2023. There were some artists that I became aware of that have very small bodies of work um, and they haven't released anything in an official capacity, but they like wowed me nonetheless. They're gonna constitute the honorable mentions. The Adventures of Atom and Delilah Retake the Earth, directed by Atom Fellows and Tucker Woolley is like Doctor Who if the Doctor was an anarchist and the show was more empathetic to how much its companions save his or her butt basically. It's a great little demonstration for something that deserves the man power to become, like, big. And it's sitting at under a thousand views at the moment, which is, like, criminal. Righteous Robot, aka Julian Curie, designs, draws, cuts, and fashions together characters and settings by himself for a feature he's been working on called Graph. He's been very transparent about the behind the scenes process and this marketing has got him a lot of eyes. It's not animation in the traditional sense, but it gives off the same kind of feel especially with an art style kind of reminiscent of Lakers stuff. Lastly, uh, Lego Me, the OG, is a 14 year old uh, who's managed to learn Blender, not only to replicate the stop motion uh, animation as CGI in the Lego movie franchise, you know, something that's backed up by like millions of dollars, uh, but sometimes like surpasses it in technical quality. The way he manages to light, smear, and choreograph action is an impressive feat for one person, especially for someone this young. So impressive, in fact, that Sony called him to like do a scene for Across the Spider-Verse. 14 year old me could never. Onwards. Part one, 
Hidari, directed by Masahashi Kawamura. This is a pilot short uh, for hopefully a stop motion animation about a craftsman martial artist in search of avenging his father. It sounds generic on paper, but its execution is like far from it. It's a demonstration of a fight scene that conveys the 2B feature's specific identity and original aesthetic. The character models are wooden, which affords a rich, scrupulously detailed sound design, apparent in how their feet hit the floorboards beneath them, how metal weapons come into contact with their bodies, or how different wooden elements are in contact with each other. Not only in combat, but like the jangly wooden fingers on our protagonist's prosthetic arm. As a kid, I loved Michael Bay's Transformers films, um, and as I kind of like retrospectively look back on them, I think to myself, um, they were kind of ass. However, some of the dialogueless um, action scenes were actually quite captivating. I didn't quite clock it back then, but the use of sparks, cables, embers, and the like spurting out of Transformers as an appropriate stand-in for blood heightened the gore of the action without directly claiming it like a human-on-human -human fight scene. Hidari does something very similar with the use of sawdust, but takes it further. It makes sense as an aesthetic choice to obscure gore with sawdust as the characters are made of wood, but we also see it as characters like slide across the floor, hit each other, or to emphasize power when they mechanize. In these ways, Dust as a naturally occurring part of the environment has multiple functions and we can tell which one it fulfills based on how it is physically induced. Both the sound design and dust give weight to movement and each connection made in combat. I love the use of different materials in this as well. The loose fabrics, tiny metal parts in the mechanical or the use of translucent orange plastic or glass. I don't know what it is to evoke heat during the saw smears. Smears are like frames that allude to motion, like that's one material that's cutting through the air, but it gives the illusion that the saw is moving really fast. Also, the texture in how the protagonist and antagonist's faces are carved too is pretty cool. The protagonist especially is great and totally takes advantage of the art style. The arm alone indicates this with its carving to denote musculature and the fact that it is like removable in the same way that you can take apart most figurines. The wooden characters in Hidari aren't an abstraction of humans, they behave as if they are aware that they are indeed wooden. I love to see this idea in stop motion to be taken to feature length heights because I feel like there's so much you could do with it. I'm very optimistic. As someone who loved making stop motion as a kid, Hidari feels like it could push the medium to unseen boundaries. Part two, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm gonna try, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm gonna call it Werewolf, but this is the title of it. This one was why I wanted to make this video, actually. So few films know how to depict the internet at the moment. Um, and I mean this in like two ways. One, how the internet and its interfacing is like presented visually. And uh, two, the kinds of relationships that the internet can like give rise to. Um, and as a result, how people, particularly children, navigate the internet. I think the only feature films that, like, have probably understood this so far have been, um, Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade and the film called Spree, starring Joe Keery. But Werewolf gets it too. I like how people and objects relevant to the immediate action flitter between two frames of illustration and they have, like, a minute difference. But even when the Skype conversation is like the center of the action, it's completely static. It also takes up the entire screen. Like, I get a lot of films try to be visually interesting by integrating screens with real life action and interaction, but it really is that simple. Screens draw attention to nothing but the screen even if there are other objects within the user's peripheral vision. It's all our protagonist sees in this particular moment, so it's all we see. The drawn art style affords the liberty of fitting the screen to the aspect ratio of the short too, lending to the quality of enveloping attention and being what is essentially a reality separate from the principal action. Importantly though, the scenes on Skype are diegetically silent. Conversations like what we see in Werewolf have an invested emotion to them. If they were performed in person, they would be, they would like evoke screaming and crying but the silence of the internet chat room is accurate and very tense we do have a soundtrack that is revealed to be diegetic but i'm talking about before that reveal the song though is glitchy and fast tempo akin to the hyper stimulating nature of social media and lyrically captures this abusive relationship pretty well but it also maintains the audience's attention so that it can use full unadulterated silence for dramatic effect werewolf also implements mimetic imagery with moments like the eye bleach 
Isaac's childish internet speech when talking to Laura most of the time, the unregistered Hypercamp 2 reference, scene imagery, and even the song to a degree. There's a real literacy of internet usage present here that I think is only achievable by someone that grew up on or using the internet and it's riveting to see it so well done. As an outside observer of the teen deviant art community during the 2010s, I can't talk about it very much, um, but it is interesting how not many other people talk about it very much. I guess it's because the discourse favored the initially more impactful, edgy, arguably all right, side of the internet instead. In the action of brushing what Angela Nagel calls Tumblr liberalism to the sidelines as a uh, relatively more accepting community, it kind of got essentialized as relatively unproblematic, uh, but Werewolf exposits more honest side to that. Lauren is 13 and being groomed by someone six years older than her, and this person is using her drawing talents to commission lewd fairy art. He uses childish mimetic language and emoticons to speak on the same level with her, but formalizes his articulation when he wants to pressure her. He believes in justifying threats with his illness. He uses contradictory rhetoric like, it's just a picture. Love bombs her when he gets what he wants. Okay, that one might be a stretch, but the rest of it, it's textbook manipulation. Werewolf is terrifying on a physical level with its almost alien and visually overstimulating presentations of wolves and werewolves. Um, but it's scary on an emotional level too. I've seen these relationships online and offline, and I've seen the effects it has on victims as well. You can see how done Laura is with this guy, perceiving him as if he hates her, but she's still attached emotionally and fundamentally through blackmail. The final scene of the metaphorical manifestation of her rage is great. Signaled by the charm around her neck and her persona's character details interlinked with it, lending to the colours used here, as well as its vibrancy and the way it can induce an epileptic fit, something her abuser suffers from. The bitten hand, shaped like a wolf shadow puppet in the light of the screen, is just one of many mixes of fairy art and online navigation that are so inherently tightly tied to one another and they're all fired in rapid succession constituting this whiplash that has culminated after the consistent build in tension throughout the whole short. It encapsulates an ecstatic energy that is, and this is what I like about it, removed from spectacle. It isn't set in the middle of a potentially world-ending climactic conflict but it is as or more emotionally enthralling and that's something you just don't see often in animation full stop regardless of length or budget. There's so much to this, I mean I'm seeing themes of like body dysmorphia in there, the presence of English in non-Anglo-centric countries, I think as well, um, implications and ethics of like furry art, I guess. Um, the use of camera and lighting is so good as well. Um, it, I just, yeah, I can't recommend it enough. I know some people are going to be like, ew, furries, but like, grow up. <laughs> Part three. Gassy's Gas and Stuff, directed by Sarah Schmidt. If Werewolf gets the internet, then Gassy's Gas and Stuff gets working in retail. And they didn't even need an unnecessarily sassy middle-aged white woman to show it, either. In Gassy's Gas and Stuff, we follow Lulu the dog's first day working at a gas station convenience store somewhere in semi-rural America. While Werewolf was a whole enclosed plot and Hidari was one part of a greater story, this short feels almost plotless. Um, almost slice of life, like a pre-Twin Peaks episodic detective opera, uh, a customer of the week, if you will. It's half the length of Werewolf, but its pacing is so much faster, so it manages to pack just as much into it. Not that density of detail is equal to value, like I like these shorts just as much as one another, which is why they're like unranked. Its art style has a very childish simplicity to it, but it doesn't shy away from things like drugs or death somewhat. I like that it appropriately abstracts designs and plays with perspective. Often those two things going hand in hand. While to a lesser extent its character designs are visually diverse like Smiling Friends or The Amazing World of Gumball. I like how Gilbert is relatively more detailed or how Boss Cat has two heads to explain his erratic personality change. I love Gator Guy in the jersey as well. He's, he's cool. I'm just picking up my news and my brew. Picking up my news and my brew. The best part about Gassy's Gas and Stuff is that it believes adult animation isn't predicated on the idea that violence is what differentiates it from children's animation. Yet yeah, it is adult animation through and through. Again, to digress, like violence or gore in something isn't like an inherently negative quality of an art object. 
like Hidari and Werewolf earn their use of graphically contorting or damaging bodies by instilling purpose that extends beyond cultivating like a visual aesthetic. However, many mainstream adult animations use gratuitous violence that I personally don't care for. The adult appeal of this short is instead in its recognition of very passive, mundane, non-violent elements of the adult experience. Struggle in work, the early morning shift, the pittance of exact change in tips, lack of care in the employment process because the place is already severely understaffed, casual but safe drug consumption, and ironically, caffeine addiction. Hey, old friend, it's been one, ten years. It pokes fun at these things without also poking the audience to make sure that they get it. I mean, they don't really have time to do that anyway. They've already moved on to the next scene. The humor is pretty standard, adult swim fair in execution, but the originality comes in its subject matter. We are starting to see adult animation that is conscious of potentially triggering subject matters like drug addiction, violence, abuse, objectification, tragedy, but in a way that instead replaces those things with like an inverse uh, or altered non-default representation. Like, like, like boobs, boobs, heart, detour, animal boobs. <laughs> Gassy's gas and stuff has overt, if covered, cartoon boobs in it and they're never sexualized as they should or, or shouldn't be i i the, the valid judgment is like positive here like i it should be normalized that boobs aren't sexualized let me let me be clear let me be clear however at the moment it is still kind of default for women to be shot as bodies in pieces particularly the play area no don't say that particularly in the chest area uh, as a voyeuristic means of emphasis gassies is conscious of the presence of this kind of gaze and avoids it never trying to highlight any one part of their female characters bodies they're just there and that's cool and before anyone starts me for analyzing cartoon characters like bodies in this way then don't you know don't act like any of you super straights weren't fucking excited for lola bunny you know, get your mind out the gutter, bro. My Adventures with Superman premiered on Adult Swim earlier this year, and while it does have Marv threat and action, it also makes a lot of space for the romantic relationship between Clark and Lois, which is not the regular way of organising plot threads in, you know, most Superman media. It's adult in how characters act mature and like their age, even if the target demographic includes children. Both it and Gassy's gas and stuff don't need to lean into abrasive images or even allude to them to be harsh or adult. They're adult in appealing to things that only adults are cognizant of, but at the same time are strictly not taboo. Uh, conclusions. Ooh. Ooh. This didn't feel like an essay in the same way that a lot of the upcoming stuff is supposed to feel like, but um, I guess if it were to have a hypothesis, it would be if you don't watch everything that I mentioned in this video, I implore you to at least um, watch the ones that I dove into. They are definitely worth your time. They're worth more than the time that you invested in watching this video, but I thank you anyway. I'd rather you left a comment than like or subscribe. So if you're not going to do either of those, at least leave a comment saying like which one of those was your favorite and drink some water. I need to.